welcome back everyone. So we finished up the uh, the perceptual system. So now we're moving into motor control and plasticity. So we're going to talk more about the the parts of the brain and also the systems that allow you to move. So the most basic unit of movement is a reflex, which is a simple, highly stereotyped, and unlearned response to a particular stimulus. Charles Sherrington's work on spinal animals, which are animals whose spinal cord has been surgically disconnected from the brain, has demonstrated that many reflexes are manifest through the spinal cord. It appears that these reflexes um, involve only the short pathways in the spinal cord leaking the dorsal and the ventral roots. So that's the most basic unit of movement is reflex. Movements are um, brief unitary activity um, of a muscle or a body part, but it's less complex than an act, whereas an act is a complex uh, sequence of behaviors. So, for instance, movements would be moving a leg, but walking would be an act. A motor plan is a set of muscle commands that's established before the action takes place, such as playing a piano or executing a dive. So, movements are the simple movements that are required to do something, and act is a complex sequence of behaviors. Um, so, for instance, walking would be an action, and a motor plan or program is a set of motor commands um, that's established before the act occurs, or before the action occurs, in order to do the action. There are two primary control systems or strategies for controlling speed and accuracy, and both have some trade-offs. In a closed-loop mechanism, um, it's a kind of negative feedback system like we've previously described. The person doing the behavior is constantly getting feedback from other senses that are modifying the behavior. An example of this is driving one's car. Uh, one may see that they turn too far into the net slate and then make an adjustment to correct the issue. Therefore, this is a closed loop system where you're getting that feedback and you're modifying your behavior based on that feedback. So, because of this, closed loop systems are accurate, but they aren't particularly fast. The movements in a closed system are often called ramp movements. These are slow, sustained motions that are continually guided by feedback. So, certainly when you have the wheel and you're driving, um, that fits this definition. They're slow, sustained movements where you gain visual information, you're processing that, and that is affecting the way that you're you're moving. You're using that feedback to affect the movement. Open loop mechanisms differ from closed loop systems because they're optimized for speed. In order to speed them up, there's no external feedback and the activity is pre-programmed. So a couple examples of this are executing a dive, throwing a baseball, uh, things like that. Open loop systems involve ballistic movements, which are rapid and will be completed no matter what sensory feedback is received. So while, for instance, with doing a dive, there's some sensory feedback that's possible, for the most part, once you take off to start the dive, you're going to end the dive. You're going to do the movements. So. Those are examples of ballistic movements where they're fast um, and they're not relying on external feedback and that's part of what makes them so fast. There's actually a hierarchy of motor systems, as you'll see, that determine the movements we're able to make and do make. So first, um, the most basic part of this is the skeletal system. So the skeletal system and the muscles attached to it determine which movements are possible. The spinal cord um, and skeletal mu muscles um, together are responsible uh, for sensory information. So with this, the simplest situation of this may be a reflex. The spinal cord also implements motor commands from the brain. So it's, as you can see in the hierarchy, the spinal cord is kind of one step up above the skeletal system and the muscles.
The brain stem integrates motor commands from the higher levels of the brain and transmits them to the spinal cord. It also relays sensory information about the body from the spinal cord to the forebrain. So now we're going to talk briefly about a couple other um, components of the brain that are important for movement. We're just going to touch on these briefly here and we'll talk about them in more detail as we go on. So first, um, the primary motor cortex is the place where um, many of the main commands for action that we have are initiated in the primary motor cortex. And then there's also the non-primary motor cortex, which is immediately adjacent to the primary motor cortex. And this is an additional source of motor commands. And it actually acts indirectly via the primary motor cortex, as well as acting through connections to lower levels of the motor hierarchy. But we'll describe this later. One thing worth mentioning, though, is if you have damage to the primary motor cortex, it often results in a partial paralysis on the contralateral side of the body. So if I have damage to my right primary motor cortex, it can cause paralysis on my left, left side of my body. The cerebellum and basal ganglia modulate the activities of these hierarchically controlled systems. So some of their contributions are routed through the thalamus in this feedback loop to the cortex. So they're in this feedback loop where they contribute to processing information and also processing the information that's coming up from the spinal cord and from the muscles, as we'll talk about more as we go along. So how do we literally move, like what is actually involved. So the skeletal muscles attach to bones in ways that indicate the movements that they cause. So because muscles exert force only through contracting, many movements require them to work as antagonists. So for instance, in the picture below where the arm is straight um, and the tricep is flexed, um, or when the arm is straight, the tricep is flexed, whereas when the arm is raised, the bicep is flexed. So thus, these muscles are antagonists of each other, meaning that one when one is contracted, the other is not. They're also synergist muscles. These are muscles that work together. So all the movements you see are going to be muscles contracting. So as you see, when you lift your arm up, it's because you have the bicep contracting, and at the same time you have the tricep relaxing, allowing that, mus that movement to happen. Then how do these actually move the body? Well, there are these tendons that connect the muscles to the bones. So that's how they're actually able to move the bones, is there are these little tendons that um, allow them to pull the bones where they need to be. Uh, a couple different types of muscles that are important to know about. Striated muscles are the type of muscle with striped appearance which are generally under voluntary control. There are two types of striated muscle fibers, fast and slow twitch. Fast twitch muscle fibers contract rapidly, but they also fatigue very rapidly. So for example, for example, the extraocular muscles that control your eye movements are fast twitch because they need to make very quick, precise movements, but they don't have to hold that long. Slow twitch muscle fibers contract slowly, but they do not uh, fatigue nearly as quickly as fast twitch. They are used to maintain our posture and they're intermixed throughout the body with the fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, in case you're curious, in chicken, the white meat are the fast twitch muscle fibers and the dark meat are the slow twitch muscle fibers. So as we discussed in previous chapters, motor neurons are the neurons that go from the brain and the spinal cord to the muscles in order to send signals to activate the muscles. They rely on acetylcholine, which is why venoms that block acetylcholine receptors also cause paralysis because they block that signal to be able to get into the to get to the muscles. So how is it that how is it that these um, signals actually get to the muscles? Well there are these neuromuscular junctions or NMJs which is the, where the motor neuron terminal meets the muscle fiber. So the NMJ is an effective synapse. So what this means is almost every action potential that occurs 
unless it's a contraction. So it's efficient in the fact that, or effective in the way that um, there's not a lot of waste. If you have an action potential, it's going to result in a, um, in a contraction and an effect. So a motor ura a motor unit is the motor neurons acts on in all of its target fibers. And these differ in size as we'll talk about with the um, innervation ratio. Actually, let's jump down to that now. So the innervation ratio is the number of fibers um, innervated by an axon. So one axon can connect to set, you know, many different muscle fibers. And the larger this ratio is, so the more uh, muscle fibers it connects to for every one axon, the less control you're going to have. And then bouncing back up to a motor unit. So a motor unit is the motor neurons axon and all of those muscle fibers that it connects to. So that's going to be your motor unit. Uh, muscles that are used for fine motor movement, such as the muscles in your hand where you have to ride and things like that, have a very low innervation ratio. So for these, usually each motor neuron only innervates one to three muscle fibers. So it's much more precise than when you have one motor neuron, you know, connecting to many more muscle fibers. So, uh, Proprioception. So this is a collection of information about the body's movements and positions. It's sometimes called our sixth sense, um, as it's responsible for giving us information about our muscles. So when you pull a muscle, you get a charley horse. These are the receptors that help alert you to the problem. They also are important for us in understanding how our body is moving and where we are in space. Uh, there are two types of receptors for this system. You have muscle spindles, which are muscle receptors that lie in parallel to the muscle and send impulses to the central nervous system when the muscle is stretched. And you also have Golgi tendon organs, which are located in the tendons and send impulses when the muscle contracts.